Hi everybody! Hi! I hope you're having another good week and um, today's story is from the Bible and it's in the book of Matthew. Matthew Hi, chapter yeah. 13. Sorry, the picture. Okay, Matthew chapter 13 and it's where Jesus tells the story in the parable of the four soils. So what I'm going to do is I have my four pots of soil on the table. So I'm going to turn the camera around so you can't see me but you can see the little pots and you'll be able to listen along and watch as I'm telling the story. As the farmer was sowing his seeds, they fell upon different types of soil. Now in my hand I have got a little seed here, okay? And this is going to go into my first pot of soil on the table here. Okay, and this little seed, I'm gonna try and put it in, this is like the first seed in the story. And do you know what boys and girls? This soil is so tough and so hard, I can't even get that seed in there. I'm not sure if that seed is ever going to grow just by sitting on the top of that soil. It simply is lying on the top of the soil because it is so hard. And do you know what happened in the story in the Bible, girls and boys? A bird came along and just picked up the seed and took it away. So the first soil is so hard that the seed was just on top of it and the birds came and took it away. The seed did not grow and it never came to anything, okay? So this seed is the kind of heart that the soil represents is someone who does not believe that when they hear what Jesus, all about Jesus and his love, they don't believe that it's true. This person might make fun of the name of Jesus, or they might laugh if somebody tries to talk to them about Jesus or pull a little face. Some of the seeds in Jesus' story fell upon some very shallow soil that was covering rocks. So look, here's my little seed. I'm going to try and put it in this soil here, but if you look under this top layer, this pot is actually just filled with stones, can you see? So if I had put my seed in that um, little pot, there would have been no depth to the soil. There would have been hardly any growth and it wouldn't have worked. There was only a thin layer of soil and this pot was mostly taken up by stones. And because the seed was only in the thin layer of soil at the top, when it started to grow in Jesus' story, the, the plants could not grow properly because the roots had nowhere to go in among all of these stones. There wasn't enough soil in there for good growth. Okay, So when the sun came up, the plant withered and it died. So our second pot is no good for growth either. And do you know what kind of heart this represents? Somebody who shows a little interest in God starts to follow him a little bit, but then when trouble or something hard comes along, they give up. This person doesn't want to suffer for their faith. They don't want to be called names at school, so they think, okay, I don't want that. I'm just going to not believe in Jesus anymore or I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. Their faces, when they face trouble, might look a little bit like this one. Okay, on to my third pot. See it there? Some of the seeds in Jesus' story fell upon soil that was already growing something else there. You can see it in my pot. There's something already growing and I'm not quite sure what it is. Okay, this seed that starts to grow, then the bramble or the weed grew up around it and would choke it. So the little seed that was planted could not be fruitful and could not grow properly. The kind of heart that this soil represents is someone who is a follower of Jesus, but who is constantly distracted from following him. So this might be that they get distracted easily, or they may get distracted by wanting more and more. And sometimes the problem with this is they get distracted is that they struggle to follow Jesus in the hard times and they don't bear good fruit. So a face when they are worried or distracted might look a little bit like this one. Okay, on to my fourth little pot here. And lastly, some of the seeds in Jesus' story fell onto good soil. Okay, here's my little pot. Let me try and get my seed in. And look, pops right in there nice and easily, nice and deep, so it's got plenty of room to grow in there. Okay? Some of Jesus' seeds fell upon good soil. 
And these seeds were able to grow and they produced a huge crop and they were really, really fruitful. So this kind of heart that the soil represents is someone who receives Jesus' message. They don't give up when the times are tough. Oops. They don't allow themselves to get distracted by following Jesus and they are fruitful. Their face might look a little bit like this one. Now I wonder, have you answered my question of what kind of heart do you have? If you want a heart that is more able to receive Jesus' message, why don't you ask him to give that to you today? Me again. Um, thank you for listening. And um, during this week, we can all think about what kind of soil are we and what kind of heart have we got. And hopefully we can all say that we try really hard to be the fourth type of soil and the fourth heart, one that when they hear um, in the word of Jesus, and say they truly hear and truly understand God's word and we can produce um, a harvest for him. So have a good week, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, let's uh, read from Hebrews chapter 11. Again, last week we looked at the end of chapter 10 and the first three verses of Hebrews 11. Um, this follows on from it. And the, the writer of Hebrews, having explained what faith is, now he gives us lots of Old Testament examples of men and women of faith. So, reading from Hebrews 11, verse 4, to the end of the chapter. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith... Though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Sarah herself, received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then the next verses, we read more details about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And then verse 23, we are told about Moses and his upbringing in Egypt and how he led the people out in the Exodus. And we read from verse 29 then. We'll refer back to the others when we're speaking. Verse 29, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered, suffered mockings and floggings and even chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in, skin of, in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. An overview of the Old Testament, some of the main characters in the Hebrew Bible. And as we saw last week, the book of Hebrews pulls back the curtain of heaven, and it reminds us why we need to have faith in God and His Word and to look beyond the trials and temptations of this life. Last week, we looked at understanding what saving faith was from verses 1 to 3. And the writer defined faith in verse 1. He said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And we saw that faith is believing what God says, despite the fact that we cannot see, touch, or hear Him. And when we walk by faith, not by sight, we will mature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the future. The chapter then continues with an overview of some of those who have been alluded to in verse 2. Verse 2 says, For by it, that is faith, the men of old gained approval. And so the writer goes on to illustrate true saving faith in Hebrews 11 using the examples of all these Old Testament saints. And he runs out of time to list all the examples, as we've seen in verse 32. He says, What more shall I say? For time shall fail to tell of so and so and so and so. And he has to call a halt to it. But he's making a point. And the point is this that each person listed in this chapter faced circumstances and challenges that were unique to their day and generation. And our circumstances and challenges are unique to our generation today. The people in Hebrews 11 came from different backgrounds. We have a contrast between Moses, who was brought up as a prince in Egypt, and later on we hear mention of Rahab the prostitute who came to faith in God. All sorts of social economic backgrounds are included. And these Old Testament saints that are listed here were very familiar to the Jewish Christians uh, who were being exhorted to remain true to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians uh, throughout the Roman world probably at that time to encourage them not to turn back to their Judaism. Judaism. And the, the circumstances were they were probably experiencing or hearing of persecution uh, during the time of the Emperor Nero. They had perhaps heard of the execution, perhaps in recent times, of the Apostle Paul executed during the time of Nero. And they were witnessing the early stages of the Jewish war and the Jewish rebellion 
against Roman occupation that eventually led to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem later after the book of Hebrews was written. So it was a rapidly changing world with much to concern them, much to make them fear and, and want to go back to the old certainties of their upbringing. And yet the writer encourages them to press on in their faith. And the writer reminds them of all the Old Testament saints, all these Old Testament Jewish saints, who God kept and saved due to their faith in God and His Word. And the implication for us today is that God can keep us too, because this book and this passage is timeless in its application, and that's why we recognize it as the Word of God. So in verse 4, the writer illustrates that true saving faith was the cause of obedient worship. It says of Abel, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Cain and Abel offered different sacrifices. Cain offered the, the fruit of the ground, the vegetables and fruit that he had produced and grown. Abel, Abel sacrificed an animal and shed blood recognized that sin demanded his death. Cain brought an offering that was the produce of his work. Abel presented a sacrifice that acknowledged his sin and his dependence on God's grace. And this should prompt us to reflect on whether we engage in true, the true worship of God, or is it the worldly worship of self? Do we aim to worship God for His honor, or is our worship about us, our self-promotion, parading our gifts which are given to us by God, concerned about how it makes us feel, or are we focused on who God is and what He has done? Are our programs and activities just, to design, just designed to reflect what we are doing? Someone has said you can't worship God by looking in the mirror because we're then self-deceived, and God is not mocked. God is not impressed by our gifts, because He gave them to us. What God is looking for is how we use them, what we use them for. Are they used for His glory and His purposes? God sees in our heart He doesn't go by the outward appearance. And then in verse 5, we read about Enoch. One of two, Enoch and Elijah, who we read of, who were taken up into heaven without having experienced death. And the writer illustrates that faith is the source of an obedient lifestyle. If there's true saving faith, then there will be obedient worship, and there will be an obedient lifestyle. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God took him up to heaven, for he obtained the witness that before his taking up, he was pleasing to God. Enoch, through his faith, was pleasing to God, so much so that he never saw physical death. If we go back to verse 6, after these two it says, and without faith it is impossible to please him, God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Fortunately, today, so many people don't even believe that God exists, never mind trying to seek him and please him. And then verse 7, Noah's faith is highlighted. By faith, Noah, being warned of God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Because Noah, by faith, believed that God would destroy mankind with a flood, he obediently built an enormous ark over a period of a hundred years. It wasn't just a flash-in-the-pan decision. It required endurance and commitment to fulfill what he had been told to do by God. And Noah 
was in a very mocked minority before the flood. I'm sure he got lots of stick, as we would say today, over that hundred years. But after the flood, Noah was in the complete majority. He endured much persecution for his faith. However, by his example of faith, Noah condemned those who rejected God. A hundred years of Noah's preaching while he built the ark, and the ark there is an artifact demonstrating his faith, condemned the unbelief of those around him and left them without excuse when the flood came. So it condemned those who rejected God and it allowed Noah to be declared righteous before God. And by God's grace, he and his family were saved from destruction. And yet through it, they condemned the unbelief of those around him. New Testament says, whoever does not believe is condemned already because they do not believe in the Lord Jesus and God's record and witness to him. And that's something that we must be cautious about. And then in verse 8, the writer continues, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Abram is an illustration of the sort of saving faith that we should have. He was brought up in this great metropolis of Ur of the Chaldees, right on the Fertile Crescent, one of the greatest cities of its day, a city with great wisdom and learning. And yet it's just a submerged ruin under lots of floodplain clay, as Sir Leonard Willey and others excavated it. In Romans 4, in the first three verses, Paul says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He had faith in God and his word, and he acted on that faith. But it was his faith in what God had said that was the important thing. His actions were only, only the evidence of the faith that he had. Abram was not the first person to have faith, as the chapter shows us. However, he was the first person of whom it was very clearly stated. Abraham believed God, and God credited that faith to Abraham as righteous. The focus in verse 8 is that he obeyed God. God called Abraham to leave his home and to go to a new place that he had never seen to receive an inheritance. Abraham's faith was not the sort of safe, pragmatic faith humanly speaking. He didn't just take the, the cautious and easy option. We're told that Abram obeyed God and went out to a place he knew nothing about, that he'd never seen. He left what was then a modern, thriving city. He left his job, his house, his friends, and any inheritance that he had there. He uprooted his family and obeyed God, going where God wanted him to go. And so it is that he's the perfect example of of the definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then verses 9-10, uh, it says, By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. He never owned the land that he went to, um, he lived as a stranger within it amongst those who were already there. And even though Abraham and his son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob entered the promised land, they did not own any of it. From the time that Abraham entered the land when he was 75 years old until he died 100 years later, they lived as strangers in their own land. Why did they live as aliens in the promised land? Well, as an example to us, the writer gives us the answer in verse 10, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. <clears throat> the key to Abram's faith is that he had his eyes fixed on something other 
than the physical aspect of this life. He had his eyes fixed on the spiritual promises of God. He was not looking for an earthly city or an earthly house. He was looking for the time in the future when he would be in the presence of God. And this is the pattern that we are encouraged to follow. As believers, we are to be fixing our eyes on the heavenly rewards that we will receive through Christ. We're not to be seeking and dwelling on our earthly possessions because we're going to leave them all behind. Verses 11 and 12, Sarah, Abram's wife, is mentioned as a woman of faith. She willingly moved around the promised land with Abraham. And Abram and Sarah waited 25 years after the promise that Sarah was going to be, get pregnant. Talk about faith. Abraham was 99 years old and Sarah was 89 when she conceived. It's hard to be patient for 25 days, never mind 25 years. And they didn't return to Ur of the Chaldees as we're told they could have done very easily. They believed God from the day that they left her until the day when they did have a child, and God kept his word. He gave Abraham a man who was of such an age that verse 12 tells us he was as good as dead, the ability to have children and to create a nation that was as innumerable as the sands which are by the seashore. And so many peoples and nations, the Jews included, look back to Abraham as their direct ancestor. And then, verses 13 to 16. The faith of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob continued the entire time they lived as aliens in the promised land. They had no citizenship there in an earthly capacity. In fact, they all died before seeing God's promises fulfilled in an earthly capacity. Verse 13 says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And if we are Christians and have experienced true saving faith, then that's the way we'll feel about our life here on earth. We'll realize that this is a passing existence, that the, the creation that God created is under a curse and that it will be ultimately destroyed and that nothing in this life will endure. How might we feel if after years in a foreign land none of God's promises came true in our lifetimes? Many missionaries have left their home shores and gone and labored in foreign fields in very trying circumstances suffering great persecution and haven't seen much result in their lifetimes. And yet, in subsequent generations, great things are seen to have happened. Abram left his home. and He buried his wife in the foreign land that he went to, but he continued to trust God, and we're told that he died in faith. Verse 16 illustrates his attitude, and it's our attitude that God's looking for. He looks in our hearts to see our motivations. They desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It's been very easy for Abram to complain about his situation, just like the Hebrews in the desert when they left Egypt. Why did we leave? Why don't we go back? But there's no mention of Abraham even considering that. He had his eyes focused on this heavenly reward and his relationship with God. And this is the same kind of attitude that we are exhorted to have today, just as the writer to the Hebrews exhorted them to have. As strangers and aliens in this world, we are to, to direct our attention to the future heavenly kingdom. And if we have that outlook and that heavenly perspective, then the things of earth will not trouble us to the same extent. Verse 17 tells us, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was, was offering up his only begotten son. 
It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. But he considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Very much an Old Testament type to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. I was watching a program this week. <clears throat> I like looking at documentaries. And this, uh, the whole HS2 rail line in England, massive project. Um, and they were, they were working in the area around Euston Station, which is to be the London terminal uh, of this new railway line. And nearby to it, in, in a place called St. James's Garden, just beside it, uh, is a beautiful park. But 200 years ago, this was a, a cemetery on the edge of Georgian London. And lots and lots of people were buried there. And there's a massive area that has been canopied off and a massive team of archaeologists excavating all the graves to be moved to a new cemetery outside of London. And as they dig down, they're discovering lots about Georgian London. They're finding a lot of the old coffins, uh, some of them in a great state of preservation, others not so much so. And one interesting vault they found was the family tomb of the Christie family of the Christie Auction House, including the man who, who founded it. And it's amazing how some of the inscriptions have survived and the epitaphs, and it's quite moving to see. And I'm sure those people, when they were buried, never ever thought that they would be uh, dug up and reburied somewhere else. And yet, you know, the people die and they have great tombs and they have paupers' graves, and yet all die. And here we have in Hebrews 11 um, the list going on. Moses in the Exodus, Rahab in Jericho, judges, kings, suffering of the Old Testament prophets, some of them just named through lack of time, because the writer says in verse 38, of whom, he goes on then to say, he says, of whom the world was not worthy. How would you like that as your epitaph and your tomb? So and so of whom the world was not worthy. Imagine that. And yet that is what God has said about all these Old Testament men and women of faith. They lived lives that uh, had degrees of suffering, circumstances that they faced that were terrific challenges for them in their days, and yet they came through it through their faith in God. So many of the prophets that we could list in which he, the writer even here just alludes to. A few months ago, or maybe near a year ago now, I was at the memorial service for Dr. David Gooding in Belfast, and um, one of the speakers said about when David Gooding went along, um, he never married and he had, he's no family, so he went along to the solicitor to talk about what would happen and with his will and so forth, and the solicitor asked him, um, is there something you'd like to be put on your gravestone? And he says, just put, not here. And isn't that a great epitaph for a Christian? Not here. Anybody looking at that will pause the, or cause them to consider um, what life's all about. And yet we're told that they did not receive what was promised. Let's go back to look at verses 39 and 40 just towards the end. And all these, though commanded through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now, you need to read that verse carefully, because if you read it in a glancing way, you'd think that we had something to do with them being made perfect. That's not what it's saying. Uh, it, it's putting it in a negative, that apart from us, they should not be made per perfect. In other words, um, without us. You know, in other words, we are included. You could put it in another way that together with us, they should be made perfect in heaven. So we are included along with them in Christ. And this is something to bear in mind um, as we close. We live after the cross. These Old Testament saints lived well before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet the saving power of the cross through the shed sacrificial blood of the Lord Jesus Christ ripples out B.C. and A.D. to atone for the sins of all the men and women of faith before 
our sins. Because God is the God of eternity. He's not bound by time. He doesn't think in terms of time. And as as Drew reminded us on Wednesday night from Job, he can do all things and no no purpose of his shall be thwarted. If we go over to look in, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, where it leads on after this, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud or host of witnesses surrounding us, a long list of examples, that is, of those who have borne faithful witness, looking back to all that have been mentioned before, um, we are to press on in our faith. We often sing in the hymn, as saints of old still line the way, proclaiming triumphs of his grace. That's very much based on Hebrews 12, 1. And for these believers, these Hebrew Christians, they were shown and reminded of the Old Testament believers. But for us, this list includes all the New Testament believers since over the last 2,000 years, all those who have gone as missionaries to different parts of the world. And we love to read missionary biographies. God will guide and keep us if we keep close to him and obey his word. Have we faith in God to the preserving of our souls as we started out at the end of chapter 10? A faith that is informed by knowledge and reason that produces food for the soul and salvation through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God? Is our citizenship focused in this world or in the heavenly better country that we've read about in chapter 11? Or are we stuck in comfort in Ur of the Chaldees, too busy building our little empires on earth, on an earth that is headed to destruction instead of the only world that ultimately matters? If Noah had followed the advice of everybody around him, and there are lots of people who give you advice, what would have happened to him? And yet the ark speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ who will carry us through from this world into the next. The one who will come to judge the world. We have considered Old Testament, New Testament, and believers since, but ultimately... If we read in chapter 12, we're led on to consider Jesus, who endured such hostility of sinners against himself. We're led on from the saints of the Old Testament to the one who came, the one through whom they were all saved. Because their faith saved them, but ultimately, just like us, it was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ that was the payment for their sins. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate example because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because he's currently in heaven pleading our cause before the throne so that we may be with him there one day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the examples in it. We thank you for this great chapter that gives us a a, a flight over the Old Testament and your workings and dealings with all the great men and women of faith. And we thank you that we can also look through the New Testament and all the men and women of faith then and all the saints who have uh, had faith and, and obeyed God and labored for him in the two millennia since then. And we We see how you kept them and saved them and worked in their lives, and we have that assurance that you can do the same for us in this day and generation and bring us to that heavenly country that you have prepared for us. And so we give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.